Herzlich willkommen in der International Lounge zu unserer Mittagssession. Ganz herzliche Begrüßung, wir sind hier und wir machen mal ganz kurz auf ein paar organisatorische Sachen noch aufmerksam, bevor wir ganz tolle Gäste begrüßen, für die Sie alle hier sind. Ähm, herzlich willkommen, wir sind nicht nur hier live, sondern auch in Facebook live. Ganz herzlich willkommen allen da draußen, auch herzliche Aufforderungen zu kommentieren und auch Fragen zu stellen, die wir dann nachher aufnehmen können. Ich werde das verfolgen und die dann zurückspielen wieder und die, die Fragen können dann auch gestellt werden. Wenn auch hier jemand sitzt und vielleicht nicht zum Zug gekommen ist, auch äh, die können dort, hier ist der Link oben auf der Anzeigetafel, auch dort äh, kommentieren und dann können wir darauf eingehen. Gehen aber nachher auch noch in die Runde, ja? Bis Du auch noch dazu was sagen? International Launch ja? heißt äh, Impulse setzen genau. und miteinander ins Gespräch kommen. Es gibt immer mal provokative Statements, das ist gut, das ist richtig und gerade als Christen muss man auch reden und über die unterschiedlichen Dinge ins Gespräch kommen. Dafür ist die Lounge da und das werden wir heute tun. Wir haben also drei Impulsgeber, einen habt ihr heute Morgen im Plenum schon gehört mit Michael Schluter und äh, wir haben zwei andere hier in der Session mit dabei. Wir werden also ein Eingangsstatement hören und dann gibt es die Möglichkeit für Rückfragen. Das kann persönlich geschehen, dass das hier direkt in der Q&A Session gestellt wird oder halt über Facebook, wie ihr wollt. Ich glaube, dann sind wir bereit zu begrüßen und als allererstes möchten wir Dr. Michael Schluter auch begrüßen, den schon viele drüben gehört haben. Er ist Weltbankökonom ähm, und hat ähm, zunächst im Unternehmen seiner Familie mitgearbeitet, bevor er Berater der Weltbank wurde ähm, in Ostafrika. Er hat eine spannende Geschichte, hat viel, viele Stationen durchgemacht, hat einige Non-Profit-Organizations und ist Leiter der Kampagne, die sich für viele Initiativen einsetzt, unter anderem auch sonntags den Ruhetag einzuhalten. Er hat ein Buch rausgebracht, After Capitalism, wir freuen uns auf alles, weil das hat schon die Gemüter ein, ein, ja, aufgewühlt da drüben. Wir freuen uns jetzt auf Dr. Michael Schluter. Oh, sorry, Michael. Michael, it's good to have you with us. Please take a seat. So, in advance to Michael, we will have Joao Modomo from Brazil. Joao Modomo, mit dem ich vorhin schon ein ganz tolles Gespräch führen durfte, hat ähm, viele Organisationen und Initiativen gegründet, lebt in Brasilien mit seiner Familie. Ähm, er hat eine brasilianische Frau, er hat ähm, interkulturelle Studien gemacht, ähm, hat vor allen Dingen das Thema Business as Mission in seinem Herzen, es ist seine Passion. Er wird vieles dazu nachher sagen und deswegen begrüßen wir ihn direkt. Ciao. Ciao, Modomo. Modomo. Ciao, it's good to have you with us. Please take a seat over there. And our first guest is a special one. Und mit dem fangen wir auch an gleich mit dem Input. Er ist stellvertretender General, äh, Generalkonsul des Staates Israels. Wir sind total geehrt, dass er heute hier ist bei uns. Er hat Studium der Rechtswissenschaften hinter sich, Finanzwirtschaft und Mathematik. Ähm, er hat ähm, Sicherheitsrecht in Israel gemacht. Er ist, ähm, hat ein Finanztechnologieunternehmen in Israel gegründet und hat viele innovative Unternehmen geleitet und Initiativen, die in Verbindung mit dem Staat Israel stehen. Auch da hören wir viel und begrüßen ihn jetzt ganz herzlich, Jonathan, Jonathan Glick. Jonathan, thanks for your coming and being with us. It's a great privilege and uh, you will start, please come here, ah. you can stand and uh, be our first guest talking about The relationship, Israel, Germany, especially the trade relationship, the religious and political aspects, we're eager to hear more about the Israel's perspective. So, welcome. Well, thank you, Timo, and thank you uh, for having me here. 
This is a very impressive audience I'm seeing here. Uh, coming and going backstage, there were just a few of you. And so I'd like to thank everybody for coming here. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren. We'll do it in English this time. Uh, and as Timo has uh, just explained, I'm here to talk about the very special relationship Israel has with Germany vis-a-vis -vis economy, innovation, technology. Um, I'm going to have a few quick words about this and then open for discussion. So I just like to hear uh, or to talk about recent events. I don't know if anybody here is aware, but I think that Israel has a lot of activity on the tech uh, background with Germany. So just from recent weeks, we've heard about a very big collaboration between Mobileye, an Israeli uh, now big startup in autonomous driving, and uh, BMW, a local company quite small or maybe a medium-sized company here in, uh, in Germany, in Bavaria. And this is not a first cooperation that Mobileye is having. Mobileye also has the same cooperation with Audi and with Volkswagen. So when most of you here are driving their Volkswagens or driving their Audis and their BMWs, uh, recent models, you are driving a piece of Israeli technology. Um, this is a very interesting field because Israel does not have a lot of manufacturing. Uh, so to say. We do um, have biotech and engineering in that field, but actually cars we do not know how to make, uh, not nearly as good as Germany. In the 60s, we've tried to make a car and it was made of plastic and camels ate it. Uh, and so we know what we are weak at and we know what, what we are strong at. And so we pursue our strengths and that is technology. So. Mobileye, dominating autonomous vehicles, is something that you have heard or are hearing or will hear much more about in the future. And other companies in the field, such as the first ever autonomous car cyber company. So anybody here who is thinking about the future, thinking about going into his Audi or his Mercedes, lying back, letting it drive the Autobahn, must be aware that also some concerns are about Sicherheit and cybersecurity in that aspect. Uh, you don't want anybody taking over of your car while you're driving. Um, well, you do. You want somebody to drive it, but not in a bad way. Uh, and so the first um, startup in that field is an Israeli startup who is now working with uh, Daimler in Stuttgart uh, for the past year. So these are two very, very, very interesting um, possibilities which German car manufacturers are right now pursuing with Israeli companies. Um, another interesting opportunity that we see in Israel right now happening in Germany is also smart manufacturing. I don't know how many of you folks around here uh, have, I'm told that we are here uh, Christian, the biggest Christian convention uh, also of business owners here in Germany. And this also relates to you because, uh, at least in southern Germany, I hear that the Mittelstanders are actually supporting the major part of the German, uh, let's say, uh, economy. Uh, and this is a very big opportunity for Israel because, as I have just mentioned, Israelis are working with uh, companies such as BMW, Audi, but none are working with Mittelstanders. And I think this is, for Israel, the biggest opportunity right now to start working with Mittelstanders in Germany in manufacturing, providing software, optimization, optimizing the processes. Um, because from my understanding, German manufacturing and German products and German engineering is the best in the world and there's nothing to say about that. We don't even think about competing with that. But if you team up with Israeli software, optimizing that making procedures faster, quicker, cheaper. That is the way, I think, for this partnership of Germany and Israel in the future to be a very dominant force in the international economy. Um, how long do we still have? Okay. Uh, so, manufacturing, big companies, Mittelstand companies. Now let's talk about how do we do this? How do we access Israel? We as a consulate are in Munich, in Bavaria, but we also operate in Hessen, Baden Wittenberg, Rheinland-Pfalz, and all of the southern Germany. We support German companies 
in their pursuit of Israeli innovation, Israeli opportunities. So any German company who would like for a match, a B2B, or even to talk about possible opportunities in Israel is welcome to approach us. We will provide you tailor-made assistance. We will provide you contacts in Israel, all relevant to your field. And this does not only need to be uh, looking for cooperation in the form of suppliers. It can also be investing. It can also be joint venture. And also, very importantly, I think you're in Germany, research and development. A very big tool right now in between Germany and Israel is Horizon 2020, which is the biggest uh, European R&D uh, funding program and also the biggest R&D funding program in the world right now. And through this funding program, German companies can partner up with Israeli companies in a joint research uh, and actually 75% of total fees would be funded by the European Horizon 2020. So this, I think, is the best for everybody. No money out of pocket, or at least barely money out of pocket. German-Israeli partnership, and hopefully in two to three years, actual research and development that can go into the German companies, into manufacturing, and into the world market. So this is R&D with Israel, one step backwards is B2B with Israel, with us, and in innovation-led um, pursuit, we also have programs for students in Germany. Right now, we have uh, three programs in southern Germany for German students. So before your master's, before your PhD, or even if you're working in a German company, you can go to Israel, experience the Israeli innovation mindset, experience Israeli startups, come back to Germany and spread this innovation management, this innovation spirit inside your company. So this would be another opportunity for German uh, Mittelstanders, German companies to send their employees. This would enrich the employee and enrich the company. Uh, I think I'm ready for questions. First of all, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your introduction and uh, insights. So as a Vice General Consul, you're responsible for the relationship. And uh, in the morning session, we already heard about the importance of relationship. So what could business people, maybe especially Christian business people, do to improve the relationship between Germany and Israel? Well, I think that... Um the biggest combination I see for German uh, religious Christian uh, business people would be combining the two, yeah? Because Israel is a traditional, uh, let's say, destination for religious travel. So going to the Sea of Galilee, visiting the place that Jesus walked the water, going to Jerusalem, Bethlehem, these are all places that already, I think, as Christians, um, this would be a great attraction. Combining this into the new Israel, so combining it into startups, innovation, Israeli tech industry, combining these two into trips to Israel would be, I think, the best way because you would both enjoy the, let's say, religious world with the religious values that we like with our families in Israel, walking where Jesus walked, and... In the same trip, we would also be looking into opportunities to increase the exposure of the German companies to the Israeli companies and the joint economy. Thanks a lot. What do you think is the biggest challenge in that relationship, Germany-Israel? So what are you struggling most? Uh, I think that the biggest, the biggest struggle is... Um, I would say there are two struggles. First, there is a language barrier that we cannot forget about because uh, Israelis uh, have good English, but German is not really a strong, uh, a strong language in Israel. And I think that um, uh, for German business, businessmen and businesswomen, Israel is not a go-to market, uh, not like China these days or the United States. So I think... Those are two main issues, the language and Israel not being an obvious destination for Mittelstandes, zum Beispiel. Thank you, thank you. Do we have 
further questions regarding this whole issue about relationship Germany Israel what do you want now we have him here that's a great privilege so you can ask any question where is the first one any questions not for now do we have some comments on Facebook not yet okay I'll wait I'll wait around here Good. so thanks a lot Jonathan Glick Thank you for very your much. coming and your contribution. Please uh, take a seat. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome the next speaker, Joa Modomo. Please come to me. I guess you had the longest way from Brazil, then USA, now Germany. That's a good trip. So you're a. Uh, um, on the edge between business and mission and there is the slang of business as mission so it's your time to give us a brief introdu introduction into that business as mission I will thank you I'm on the edge I'm on the ledge I feel like I'm on the ledge I'm gonna fall off and crash and burn we're, we're getting into uh, kind of tricky territory sometimes when we talk about business as mission but just before I go, Jonathan, I kept waiting for you to use the phrase startup nation. I don't know if it's too cliche or if it's politically incorrect, but I was waiting to hear it. Uh, you're not wrong, but I think uh, startup nation is, uh, I, I use a new one, it's scale up nation. I just don't want to do what everybody's doing. Right. And I'm happy that you brought startup nation for me. That's good. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. We, we admire Israel because of that characteristic. And in fact, that has to do with, with what I'll talk about. When we talk about business as mission, entrepreneurship has uh, innovation, creativity has a lot to do with what we're talking about. So I'll start off with the, with the definition. Uh, and then we'll unpack it. So we're going to have a definition. I know, sorry, it sounds a little bit too uh, like, much like a classroom, but we'll unpack it and it should be enjoyable. And then we'll hopefully get to some questions. Um, definition, if I say business as mission, what is it that I'm talking about? And, and I'm representing, there's not an orthodoxy behind this per se, but there is, it, it is somewhat standardized. But you need to know at least when it comes out of my mouth, what am I talking about? So thank you for the invitation to, to be able to talk about this. Business's mission is the doxologically motivated, and remember, we're going to unpack this. Strategic use of business activities, genuine business activities, to create genuine ministry opportunities, to bring about spiritual, economic, social, and environmental transformation to lives, families, communities, societies, and nations. So if we unpack that, the first thing that I said was it's doxologically motivated. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look through literature or if you go back to classic virtues from Aristotle or if you come up, go to Aquinas, Augustine, or Calvin, or the Wesley brothers, you see, the, the, the list gets larger, but you see these ideas of virtues that we understand can and should be manifest through business. But doxologically motivated backs us up one more step, and it says we're not just concerned about the common good, working out those virtues through business for the common good, we're also concerned about the king's glory. So, if you're motivated by a desire to see the God of the universe glorified through genuine, authentic, creative, innovative business activities, then the common good takes care of itself. So, so doxologically motivated means for the glory of God. And we understand that, that if, if that's your driving passion, if that's what drives you, then common good genuinely results from that. So moving ahead of that motivation. Now, what, what, if that's our foundation, what do we get to? We said genuine business activities. And for those who come from a business background, you, you might have snickered or snuffed. Uh, snuffed is not even the word in English. I don't know what language I would use that word in this context. Just stick with snickered. You, you might have scoffed, I think is the word I wanted in English, because you're, you're thinking, but of course, because all business theoretically is supposed to be real business, right? And this is the ledge I was talking about because when we're talking about business and uniting it with a mission, very specifically a biblical gospel mission, then you've, you've got people who are genuinely motivated but are going to go 
pretend like they're doing business and they don't really do business. They just use it as an excuse to be in a place or to get a visa or to have people pay a little bit of attention to them. And so we say, just so that everybody will be at ease when you hear somebody from a ministry background, a missions background, a pastoral background, talking about business as mission, we absolutely are talking about business that anybody in the world would understand to be real and good and genuine and uh, forgive me for saying this, or maybe don't, maybe you can applaud. Profit-driven business, we're looking at financial profit and the other types of profits that I mentioned, environmental and social and spiritual. So it's real, it's genuine, and it creates these opportunities to manifest what we understand in the biblical message. When you look at Genesis to Revelation or when you look throughout redemptive history, this idea of a great and glorious God who desires and deserves to be known and worshipped through all activities, including business, when you look at that, you say, well, then absolutely we should be using business for His glory. In other words, we're creating real ministry opportunities to bring about transformation. So I, I said authentic, but when I say authentic, you, it's real, it's genuine. Ministry opportunities that are created by virtue of that business existing. And then the transformation that I mentioned, which is, just think like this, fourfold return on your investment. It's not just one. It's not just financial. Or fourfold bottom line. Or corporate social responsibility plus, add a fourth one, which is the spiritual component. So you're looking at this financial or economic, you're looking at this spiritual, you're looking at this social, and you're looking at an environmental bottom line or return on your investment so that lives, families, communities, societies, and nations will be transformed in that fully orbed, that complete biblical gospel sense of transformation. So I'll give you one example, and then maybe we move into uh, some questions. S colleagues of mine in Brazil, so, uh, boa tarde, by the way. D boa tarde. Anybody speak boa tarde? I know there's one out here that's going to say boa tarde to me. Boa tarde. So, uh, so in Brazil, uh, one of my activities includes actually leading an organization that some people would look at and say, that's a mission organization. And they think in a, in a conventional sense of missions, which is you train people theologically, and you send them, after they pastor a while in Brazil, then you send them overseas maybe, preferably to an unreached nation or people group, and then they will go and evangelize and plant churches. And if, if you're feeling a little bit cynical, you might say proselytize because you don't like it. But that, you're thinking, okay, it's a conventional mission agency. We're not a conventional mission agency because we look at bringing all of these types of transformation, not just spiritual. Spiritual is ultimately what we are after. But we see in Scripture that there are other uh, types of transformation that must occur together in that whole package. And so I have the privilege, uh, among other things, of leading this particular organization. And one of the families that, that we had the privilege of sending to a country that ends in Stan, you'll have to take your pick. I'm not going to say which one it was. You have seven options, at least in English. This, and I won't tell you the real names either, but we'll call them Marcos and Maria. And Marcos and Maria, when they finished university in Brazil, he was an engineer, trained for engineering. She, she ultimately became a university professor. And still in their 20s, they said, well, God, what if we go be missionaries? Would you like us to be missionaries? And God said, not now, but go to seminary part-time, go ahead and get your training, get some cross-cultural ministry skills, because maybe one day I will send you. And they were a little bit disappointed because they really wanted to go, but they didn't have that liberty yet. So Marcos established his career as an engineer in the city of Sao Paulo, so 20 plus million people. And Maria began to establish her career. They had two little kids, ultimately more. And around the age of 30, they knocked on God's door again and they said, well, is it now? Are you going to send us now? And God said, no. And they said, well, doggone it. They wouldn't have said that, but something similar in Portuguese. And then they continued to establish their family, to establish their careers, to establish uh, Marcos Engineering Firm in Sao Paulo. They knocked on God's door again, 10 years later, roughly 40 years old. God, is it now? Because we're kind of maybe halfway through our lives. So you ought to send us now, God, otherwise it may not even be worth it. God said, no, it's not now. And so a little bit disappointedly, but continuing firm in their faith, they pushed ahead and 
By the time they hit around 50, and it wasn't literally every 10 years, but you, you understand what I'm doing here. They, they said, okay, God, we, we know how this goes. We're going to say, is it now? And you're going to say no. So we're not even, oh, what? Now? Okay, God. And so they packed their bags now in their 50s, and they went to one of these Stan countries as an engineer with an engineering firm because they were able to leave everything functioning in Brazil just fine in the hands of one of the sons. And they went to this stand. I, you're looking at me like I'm supposed to stop, but the, I got to end this story because it's a great story. I, I told her that she could cut me off at any time, but please don't cut me off in the middle of the story. All right. So what happens? They get to the stands, that he, one of the stands. They, he begins to work as an engineer. And on one of his journeys, he's on an overnight bus ride because they have offices in three different cities and um, you don't fly in that country because you have like a 75% chance of dying. But if you take the bus, it's only a 50% chance of dying. I, forgive me if you're from one of those countries. I'm from, from one of those countries. and You've you got to pick your transportation mechanisms well. And so he's on an overnight bus ride. He's sitting next to a man. Remember, Marcus is a Brazilian Christian. And he's sitting next to a Muslim, predominantly Muslim context. And, and the man says... Who are you and what are you doing here? Because he's clearly a foreigner, Marcus was, and you don't go to that country unless you're a spy or doing something illicit or a missionary, which would actually be the worst of the three options probably. And so you're, all, you're automatically suspect. And so Marcus says, well, I'm an engineer. And in a little bit of disbelief, the man says, well, what, what's the name of your firm? And when Marcus said the name of the firm, the, the man had a literal physical expression on his face. He reacted, and Marcus says, you know us? Have you heard of us? Why are you looking at me like that? And the man then told Marcus this story, which I'm going to tell you right now, which is that man comes from a region of his country which is susceptible to earthquakes. And uh, a few years prior to that, actually, there had been a devastating earthquake, and in a, in a village of twenty to 25,000 people, every single building in that village had been destroyed. And this Muslim man was saying, there was only one building that did not collapse. And it was the building that you Christians built. And he said, we Muslims built garbage for ourselves. I lost family members in that earthquake. I lost colleagues in that earthquake. I lost friends in that earthquake. Why is it so different? Why would you care to build something with excellence that wasn't even for your own benefit? Well, Marcus said, I'll, I'll be g glad to tell you why I care. I'll be glad to tell you why we do things with excellence. Now, he, he actually was able to explain a Christian biblical understanding of what it means to know God through Jesus Christ. And that man, as far as we know, may not yet have ever professed faith in Jesus Christ, but he had a chance. He had an opportunity to understand what the fully lived out gospel looks like. And in this case, he understood it through business. He understood it through not just a person who was on mission, but who had a vehicle, which was the business, and that business was on mission. So we, we say business as mission. Great. Thanks a lot, Joao yeah. Moromo. With our um, business coalition at the World Evangelical Alliance, we always try to connect these areas of uh, business people, business uh, ministries, and the various alliances, churches, church leaders. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, especially in the European hemisphere or also Western civilization, we have a separation of tasks. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, very uh, successful companies and wealthy business owners who donate money to the NGOs and churches and church ministries. Yeah. So you bring a new aspect of that relation. How could we overcome that separation of tasks? Yeah, that's great. Well, actually, it, it's, it tends to be not merely a Western or developed world um, obstacle. Uh, if, I, if I could couch this or frame this just a little bit differently. Well, it's the same thing. I'm just going to use different words. You're referring to, at least partly, a sacred-secular dichotomy. So there's a dualism where we understand that you're sacred on Sunday and that Monday through Saturday or whatever your work week happens to be, that's a different thing. That's secular, and it does not have any uh, sacred value in it. Uh, that's a problem in Brazil. That's a problem in Latin America in general. And it's a problem where it's not, a, it's not 
necessarily based on culture. It can be cultural. There, um, a guy named Gert Hofstede did, did a study internationally in business organizational cultures about power distance. And there are some cultures who are oriented hierarchically. We know that. But the issue is more theological. The issue is related to the fact that where the gospel has arrived to places, it's arrived often in a Western packaging. And we're the ones that did a huge misservice a misinterpretation of New Testament teaching and a disservice to the church, which is to say that you've got your clergy class over there and then you've got your, your laity over there. And the clergy are the ones we all ought to aspire to because they're the ones who are really chosen and blessed by God. And everybody else, you just go do whatever it is that you figure out how to do and give your money to the clergy and they'll figure out what to do with it. And so that, that would be maybe business for mission where you generate an income, you give the money to a church or an NGO or a mission agency and you let them figure out what to do with it. But God has given us all this privilege and call and responsibility with respect to stewardship to steward resources, if not actually to generate those resources. And so business as mission says you're going to, as a business professional, potentially you could have more of an, an eternal impact than a religious professional, than a clergy. So many places in the world that are still needy of access to what the Bible teaches about God that have never had it, and a, and a pastor can't go, and a conventional missionary can't go, but a business professional can. So the challenge to answer that question is we, we've got to re read, we've got to understand correctly our New Testament teaching, um, uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, for example, that we're all a royal priesthood, a holy nation, we're all chosen by God and set apart so that we may declare his glory. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Do we have any further question here in the audience? Some comments on Facebook? Okay. Yeah. Hello, Matthias Taub. How do you pick the businesses, the sectors that uh, the missionaries are in? How do you build them? How do you make them sustainable? How do we pick them or how do we build them? Well, okay, so... All right, um, I'll, I'll see if I can answer that briefly. The, f the first thing I would say is um, we would, gosh, how do I say this without sounding, uh, we, you used the dichotomy that I was just talking about, and, that, and, and that's one of the things we're, sorry, that was real blunt, and I, I'll, I'll shake your hand afterwards and we'll be friends, I'm not trying to offend you. Uh, when, when we say, how do you get the missionaries to fit into business, and we're saying, Okay, that is an approach, but in reality, we're saying everybody that's called and gifted to any type of professional activity, how do we fit them into the mission? And, and that's maybe even more significant. In fact, I would affirm that it is more significant to what we're trying to do. But then it still gets to that question. Um, so part of it.